This is Matthew chapter 12. A lot of good stuff in Matthew chapter 12. Can't wait to get into it. So we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 12. And I put a quick outline up here because there's 50 verses. Boy, we got to hurry to get through this, right? But um, it talks about Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath in verse 1 through 8. 9 through 14, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. I wonder if it was his right hand or his left hand. I don't know. Does that mean anything? There's things in the Bible I wonder about. God gives you a specific detail. Is that prophetic of something in the future? As I don't know what that is, but I think it's interesting. Well, then Jesus withdraws. He gets away for a little bit from the people that want to kill him. Verse 22 to 34 is about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And some people think they've done that. We're going to see today that that's not something you can do. All sin is forgiven through the cross. So when is this possible? Can't wait to get into that and show you when that can take place. Tree known by its fruits in verse 33 through 37. And Jesus talks about uh, by your fruits you shall know him, uh, know them. Well, he said that already. And we saw that before. So it's interesting that he mentions a tree twice. What is the tree supposed to be a type of? Israel is a type of a fig tree and even an olive tree, believe it or not. Um, then they have the sign of Jonah in verses 38 through 42. Verse 43 to 45, Jesus talks about when somebody gets an unclean spirit and then when it leaves, it comes back. Unless you're saved. Now, when you're saved, they can't come back. Thank God. But then uh, 46 through 50, Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters. So there's a lot to get into, and hopefully we can go pretty quick. But there's some things here in this chapter that I've always struggled with. I never truly understood. And I'd read it over and over, and I'd be like, what is that talking about? But wow, I really, as I studied through this, it, it became clear some of the things that it's saying. And I was kind of like, praise the Lord, there's finally something that I got an answer to. So I hope this will be a blessing to you as well. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 1. And it says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And so here we have a story of Jesus and his disciples going through on the Sabbath day. Now that's kind of like a uh-oh, right? Because on the Sabbath day, what, is that, what does that mean for a Jew? You're not supposed to do any work whatsoever on the Sabbath day under penalty of death. So here Jesus is doing something, and the Pharisees had every right to go, uh-uh, you don't do that, the law says. And so that's what always troubled me. It's like, well, why would Jesus do that if he knew that the law said you shouldn't do that? Did Jesus break the law? Well, some people look at this verse and say, see, Jesus is a sinner. I think Jesus was teaching them something, and I think what he's teaching them shows that he could do that because he is the law. He is the guy that wrote the law, so he is the guy that can change it whenever he wants. So that's what I think, and as we read through here, I think you'll see that. But just look at the word corn. A lot of times when we read the Bible and we see that, we think Jesus is going through a cornfield. The word corn means kernel, right? So any type of a plant that bears a kernel... That's corn in, in the old English, corn. So it wasn't like a corn cob. He was going probably through a wheat field, and you know wheat has a kernel? So that's the kind of thing it's talking about. So nowadays we change the definitions of word. We look at corn, we think it was a bunch of corn cobs. Well, they say they didn't have corn cobs in Israel during that time. What did they have? They had wheat. So you look up the word corn in the old English, and it's kernel. So it's not an error or anything. We're not changing. We're just looking at a definition of a word. Because for us, sometimes the words change the definition. So a kernel. So they were going through there, and they were cutting wheat, and were probably grinding bread right there on the spot. You know, the Bible talks about your daily bread. So here's what they did. It says, verse 1, And at that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. So who's doing it? Well, it wasn't Jesus, so we can't say Jesus broke the law because he didn't do it, but his disciples did. So Jesus was allowing them to do something. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now I'm going to go ahead and read verse 1 through 8, then we'll come back and comment, and then we'll continue. So keep reading here, and it says, verse 3, But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of bread and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests and the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? So he gives them two illustrations of somebody doing the exact same thing. And 
the Pharisees would have gone, well, no, we don't think it was wrong for them to do it. So he's, he's really given them, I like this, how Jesus always gives examples, and they can't say anything back. Otherwise, they'd say David was wrong. Otherwise, they'd have to say, yeah, we and our priests are wrong. <laughs> Who wants to admit that if you're one of those? Hmm. And so it says, verse 6, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. So Jesus is saying that his disciples are guiltless by doing that, even though the law said don't do that. So why, why the change? Well, one word, dispensations, okay? All right, so it says here, um, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So let's go back and look at this in each, each um, verse, verse by verse. But here we see Jesus doing something on the Sabbath day that makes the Pharisees angry. It's actually, it's his disciples doing it, but no doubt Jesus allowed it, right? Because they were hungry. And um, they came, the Pharisees, and they claimed it's unlawful. But they forgot the precedent. When something happens in law, it's called a precedent. And so if that's allowed, then later it's allowed too. So the precedent is, well, David did it when he was hungry. And so if he is a king and he was allowed to do that, who is Jesus saying that he is? He's a king too, right? King Jesus. So it's, it's always right there. It's always pushing you to either Jesus is the Lord or he's king or he's God. And I just love reading it over and over and seeing, oh, now this is saying he's a king. So a king did this already, King David. The king makes the law. So the king can change the law. So what is Jesus saying here? That he is the king, right? So they should be like, oh, okay, well, you're the king. Oh, well, no problem. But they don't. They get all upset and they want to kill him. That shows their heart is they don't want him no matter what. And he's doing something that a king did before, proving that he is the king. Now, they say in verse 2, Behold, the disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now, where is that in the law? Let's go to, back to Exodus chapter 20. In the law, we have the Sabbath given to Israel. And according to the law, you weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath day. You weren't even supposed to start a fire. And so here they are making bread. Well, this is a special exception because the law and the prophets are until John. Remember that? And we have in the Bible, we have Moses' ministry, which is the time of the law. We have John's ministry, which was very short, about six months. We have Jesus' ministry, which is about three and a half years. We have the Apostles' Doctrine, or the Apostles' Ministry. And all this is to Israel. But because Israel rejects their Messiah, then we have Paul's ministry. And we're under Paul's ministry today. Then we're going to have the two witnesses' ministry when the tribulation comes after the rapture. And then we have Israel and the church together on earth. Israel in their physical bodies and the church, us, in our spiritual glorified bodies. I meant to write glorified, but, you know, it's a glorified body we get. So we have to realize that there are dispensations in the Bible. We are not under the ministry of Moses today. We're not under the Old Testament law. We're not under John the Baptist's ministry today. We're not under Jesus' ministry today. <gasps> People say, oh, don't judge it. Jesus said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, some things he said we can spiritually apply to us, but some things he was saying only to them, like cut your right hand off. That's not for today. So you got to understand God gave us Paul because the Jews rejected their Messiah. And more today, Gentiles are being saved. And he said he was the apostle to the Gentiles. So back to Exodus chapter 20, and let's look and see what does it say there about the Sabbath. You have people in this world today that claim that we're still under the law. And there are churches all over America and the world where they go to church on Saturday. Guess what? They're disobeying the law <laughs> because you're supposed to stay home <laughs> and not start a fire. Well, every time they get in their car to drive to their meeting, broom, that's a combustible engine. They just started a fire. So they're breaking the law while they claim to be keeping the law. Hypocrites! Right? Same thing that these Pharisees are as a bunch of hypocrites. So Exodus chapter 20 and we'll look at verse 10. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Seventh day would be the last day of the week. What is the last day of the week? Saturday. Saturday. A lot of people think it's Sunday because we think the weekend. 
But Sunday is the first day of the week. So Saturday is the last day of the week. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So we have here what it says is to keep the Sabbath day. Um, so go to Exodus chapter 31 and look what it says there. What is the penalty of not keeping the Sabbath? Uh-oh, look what it says in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13. Exodus 31, 13, the Bible says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Notice that's for Israel, not for us today. We are not instructed in the New Testament to keep the Sabbath. That's Old Testament to Israel. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, Israel, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. You want to tell me that's for today? Boy, every time I go garage sale and somebody has the right to stone me then. Is that what you're telling me on Saturday? I don't think so. That was for them then. We're not under that now. It's a different dispensation. Verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Again, it's for Israel, not for us. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel. I mean, you can't get more dogmatic than that. How can anyone... Seventh-day Adventist church, that's who they are, say, nope, we're still under the law. We have to keep the Sabbath. Oh, okay, so which one of the 12 tribes are you from? That's my question because it's only for Israel, okay? And uh, we'll continue the end there. What does it say? It is a sign, verse 17, between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him, Upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So this is for Jews. Remember, signs are for Jews, right? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 12. So the Sabbath was for Jews. And here was Jesus, a Jew. And so Jesus and his disciples were sinning against the law if they were still under the law. But we read the passage that said the law and the prophet are until John. So something's about to change. There's some sort of a transition period taking place before it goes to a different dispensation. If you don't believe in dispensations, then you should be out there killing people for keeping the Sabbath. If you do that, you should go to jail <laughs> because that is because you're not Israel, number one. And number two, thou shalt not kill. So how could anyone try to make it where we're still under this? And yet a lot of people, they'll read the Bible and they're unbelievers. A lot of them are atheists and they read the Bible and they say, well, see, Jesus is the one that gave the law and he doesn't even keep it himself. Well, how come? Because he's come to change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So because he is the lawgiver, he can change the law whenever he wishes. Right. Like the king. The king can say, well, that was the law then. This is going to be the law now. So I do not see Jesus Christ as a sinner or his disciples. Now, the Pharisees, all they see is the law. They don't see Jesus as the lawgiver. So they are trying to condemn him. What does the Bible say the law does? The law condemns. There's a difference between the law and grace. The grace over here overlooks some things, doesn't it? But the law tries to condemn you on every point. If you get put in jail, there's going to be a person coming along called a prosecutor. And he's going to try to find everything you did wrong. And usually they don't prosecute, I can't even say the word, prosecute you for just one little thing. They try to get you for three or four or five or six or seven or eight or uh, let's say in the case of Trump, I don't know, 26 different things or something. I mean, they really, all they care about is some lawyer wants to win a case so he can brag about himself. That's why when you go to the courthouse, there's a statue of a woman holding scales and she got a blindfold on. Right? Because... It's blind. It's not about truth in many courtrooms. It's about whoever can win. So the law is very condemning. Thank God we're not under the law. We're under grace. And so those are different. 
So the sign is for the Jews, the Sabbath is for the Jews. So the question is, did Jesus and his disciples sin by doing this? Well, if he was a man, then yes. And they were right. But is Jesus a man? He's God. He's God. So God is the lawgiver, so God can change the law or amend it to make an exception. Also, Jesus is the judge. So when we look at Jesus, we see Jesus is God. He's also the king. He's the lawgiver who actually gave the law in the first place. But he's also the judge. If you go before a judge, do you know the judge can say, yeah, the law says that, but I'm the judge, so I'll throw the case out. So here he is on the, on the earth, the guy that gave the law, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I wrote that law. I was my own finger. Yeah, I, I know, but I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it slide. That's grace. <laughs> so it's good to have a king who's sinless. If you have a corrupt king, that's not good. But a, a good king can overlook the law sometimes and let you off. That's called a pardon. So Jesus, in his mind, is pardoning his disciples to go do that. But those Pharisees, they don't want to let it go because they have an agenda and it doesn't jive with their agenda what Jesus is doing. So they're trying to use the law against him. There's a word for that. You know what that word is? Lawfare. Have you ever heard of that word? There's warfare and then there's lawfare. And that's what we're seeing in America today. People using the law against other people. And that's sad. And if you have a corrupt prosecutor and a corrupt judge, then a person who is totally innocent can end up in jail through this. And eventually that's what happened to Jesus. He who is totally guiltless, I mean completely sinless, ended up in jail and ended up being killed. Isn't that sad? But that was what the law said. If you don't keep the, the Sabbath, you are to be killed. So the Pharisees thought they were doing right. They were justifying what they were doing and say, yeah, but it's right here in the law. But where was the grace? You see, it's supposed to be balanced. And a lot of times we see people go to an extreme on one side or the other. So back to Matthew chapter 12. The Pharisees try to condemn Jesus with the law and his disciples. But Jesus speaks up in verse 3. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was unhungered, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? So Jesus says, oh, okay, you want to condemn us with the law. What about King David? You're going to condemn him? And they were probably like, no, no, we won't condemn him because they looked up to him and they realized, yeah, well, he's the king. I mean, the king can do whatever he wants. So why didn't they accept Jesus as the king? Do you see that's what this whole thing is pointing to? Jesus is saying, do you not understand my authority? I'm God manifest in the flesh who wrote the law right here before you. And you just need to come to me and accept me. And they wouldn't. So they were obstinate. But where does this take place? It's in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Let's read that real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 21. And in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1 through 6, the Bible says, Then came David to Nob, to Abimelech, the priest. And Abimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto Abimelech, the priest, The king hath commanded me a business. And has said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee. And what I have commanded thee, I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So... <laughs> Should I go there? <laughs> you're unclean when you're with a woman. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's what they thought back then. But he said, I have sanctified myself for three days. What an odd thing for King David to say. 
because Jesus for three days and three nights and went, well, there's something to that maybe, you think? Jesus is the unleavened bread. Isn't that interesting? So when Jesus is speaking, he knows that the Pharisees know the Bible and he wanted them to think about that story. And maybe, just maybe, they would have thought, oh, well, oh, yeah, yeah, David's a king. Oh, is he saying he's king? Oh, bread, yeah. Well, he said sometime a while back something about him being the, the bread of life or something. I mean, he's, he's dropping hints that we see, but did they see back then? I don't know. But I do know that it's an interesting story. And the, the priest literally gave David bread to eat that, according to law, he wasn't supposed to eat. Who ate that bread? The priests. So that brings us to the three offices in the Old Testament. Do you know what the three offices are in the Old Testament? The three offices, today we have offices of pastor, evangelist, deacon, missionary. But the three offices of the Old Testament were prophet, priest, and king. And there were very few people that held all three. Did you know David was one of those people? David was a prophet. He wrote Psalms with a lot of prophecy in it. David was a king. Now, he wasn't a priest because he wasn't from Levi, but there was a time when he bought the land that is now Jerusalem, and he went up there and he offered sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord accepted it as though he was a priest. You know, Saul did that, King Saul. He tried to offer sacrifice to the Lord, and God got angry and said, Uh uh, I'm not accepting that from you. I'm accepting it from Samuel, not you. So it's funny how God will take exception sometimes. And God took exception and said, I want this guy, David, to be a type of me three different ways, prophet, priest, and king. There's another guy named Moses. But was Moses that? Well, no, Moses was a prophet. And Moses, Moses I guess, could be looked at as a king. In fact, the Bible calls him the king of Geshurun. Did you know that? But Moses was not a priest. His brother Aaron was instead. So there's very few people in the Bible that's all three. But David is prime example of all three. Now, is Jesus all three? Jesus is a prophet. He is a king. He's the king of Israel, literally, through his genealogy. Is he a priest? Well, not yet until he dies. But when he does, now he's our high priest. So, isn't that amazing? So, it's just fun to read this. And uh, let's continue there, Matthew chapter 12, and see what's actually going on. Matthew chapter 12. So, Jesus gives the example of David and how God had grace on David in the Old Testament by allowing him to eat that bread even though he shouldn't have. And so, I guess he's kind of going, hey, if I'm the king, I can have grace on people whenever I want. Did God have grace on anybody else in the Old Testament? Yeah, there was some grace in the Old Testament. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. David, he sinned a sin that he should have died for, but he, he, he didn't get killed. That's called the sure mercies of David. God had mercy, so showed grace on him. Now, the next thing that God says is in verse 5. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Now, when I read that many, many times, I couldn't figure out what that was talking about. Now I think I understand. They were supposed to cook show bread every single day under the law. So the law says, don't work on Saturday. But then the law said, except unless you're a priest, and then you have to cook bread for the show bread because that has to go every day. So do you see how there can be a law that applies to everybody, but then an exception over here for somebody else? We went out to eat the other day. A family called us up from Georgia and wanted us to go out and eat with them. So we went to the to the uh, Pensacola Beach, uh, what is it, Quiet Water Beach area. And I walk up and it says, no pets. And then it says, except for, and what do they call the dog? What is that called? A, a, except for service dogs. So I looked at it, I go, no pets, except for pets. I mean, basically, it's like, no pets. It said, absolutely no pets is what it said. Absolutely no pets, except for. So no pets, except for you know, a pet. <laughs> All I have to do is say, well, that's my service dog. And I can have a pet. So that law is meaningless, isn't it? But see how you can have a law but have an exception? So I just found that interesting. So God is telling the, the priest, hey, you're coming to me trying to condemn me <laughs> for making bread, or my, my disciples, and you're doing the same thing. And it's okay according to the law for you to do it, but you want to say it's not okay for us. You see how that works, how people do that? They use the law against you, and it's just kind of a sad thing. 
But I just, I, man, I totally started understanding this as I read it this week, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So this is what I'd call a special exception for them, and uh, they were doing this. Now, there's a lot more we could get into, but I, I got all this up here out of my notes. I wanted to show you the prophet, priest, and king, and how this is pointing to Jesus as being God, king, lawgiver, and judge. And so they're coming out there trying to judge God, and he's going, no, I'm going to judge you. Do you even know the law? You guys can do it, and it's lawful. Why can't I, as the king, do something? Why are you condemning me? It's like going to a judge and trying to put a judge in jail. <laughs> you know, most cops overlook what the judge does. I saw a video on YouTube one time where this cop pulled over a guy, and this guy got out, was all angry and screaming, Don't you know who I am? Call it in right now! Don't you know who I am? And that cop was like, and he comes back, and then the cop comes back and goes, you're good, bye. And he goes, I told you, and he drives off. And you're sitting there thinking, what is this? That was the judge. <laughs> He's above the law, isn't he? What a, oh, what a rotten judge, man. He should have been nicer. He, but the cop let him go because he was the judge. So when you're the judge, you're not supposed to be condemned by the law, are you? You're supposed to be following the law. It didn't sound like that judge was because he was speeding. And they let him go, and I don't know why. But anyway... So uh, you should uh, have to follow the law if you're a judge. But back to uh, Matthew chapter 12, and it says, next thing that says, verse 6, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Now, who is the one greater than the temple? Jesus. So here they are, and Jesus is saying, I am greater than the temple. Now, the temple was the place you went, and you had to be holy, so you had to purify yourself to go in the temple. Jesus is saying, I am greater than the temple. So if those are his disciples, then they should already be holy, huh? From him. So they can go break bread because they're holy. So they're under his protection, if you will. And uh, it's interesting that he talks about himself as a building. A temple is a building. Well, Jesus is a building too. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. And, uh, well, there's that song. Ray, help me here. What's it? I'm a building, a building. Or How's that song go, that hymn? I'm working on a building. You know what I'm talking about? That you, you know it, Dale, Sister Dale. I'm a working on a building. You know that song I'm talking about? I don't know all the words. But I listened to that song, and I was just like, that's weird. What are they building? Are they building a new house out by the beach or something? I'm like, what? And then it dawned on me, oh, well, the body of Christ is a building, so I'm building the body of Christ. And so at first I was like, that's a weird song to be singing in church about just building some house. But then I said, oh, it's all spiritual. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 to 22. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Okay, what lives in a building? A household. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy, what? Temple. In the Lord, just like Jesus said, he's greater than the temple. So he is the temple. He is the building in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. So that building is the body of Christ, which is the church. And uh, we've looked at it before, but the church is also called the city, New Jerusalem. So somehow, Jerusalem, we are a building. And the more people get saved, the bigger that city or that building gets. And I believe that's where we have our mansions in New Jerusalem. And boy, we could get a lot more into that, but I'm going to just say that in passing. So the more people get saved, the bigger the building. So I'm working on a building, a building. The more people I can get saved, the bigger the body of Christ becomes, which is, um, like it says, it's like a, a building or a temple. Now, verse 7. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So Jesus is looking at his disciples as guiltless because he, the king, the lawgiver, the judge, told them, go do that because we're hungry. They're looking at that as, no, you're not allowed to do that. But what Jesus is also doing, he's quoting scripture and he's quoting Hosea chapter 6. So turn back to Hosea chapter 6 and look at what Jesus is quoting. Now, these Pharisees sat around and read their Bible every day. And so whenever you quoted a passage of Scripture, they should have been able to finish it. Because that was what they were supposed to do all day, was sit around and read it. So a lot of times Jesus will tell them, okay, Hosea is after the book of Daniel. A lot of times Jesus will tell them a verse. And when you go back and look at that verse that he's quoting, the next verse condemns them. 
And I found that amazing here when I go to Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 and see what Jesus quoted. The next verse, verse 7, condemns the Pharisees. So if they had looked up the verse that Jesus just quoted and read the next one, their conscience would have condemned them and they would have gone, Dope, and they probably would have felt really bad. So Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6, Jesus quotes this, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. <laughs> Here's God standing right before them, and they didn't even realize it, I guess. And then the verse 7 says, But they like men have transgressed the covenant, there have they dealt treacherously against me. That's a prophecy of a certain time in history when the people of Israel will deal treacherously with God. And there's where it just happened in Matthew chapter 12. And the Pharisees don't even realize what they just did. They condemned their creator right there to his face in front of them. Isn't that amazing? It's fun to go check the cross references. So it looks like it's talking about the Pharisees there. And the guiltless, of course, would be Jesus because there's no guilt in him. 1 Peter 3.18 says the just for the unjust. Jesus is the just. So you don't accuse a just man. But also, he's looking at his disciples as guiltless because they're out there doing something for him. Now, back to Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Now, I've read that over many, many times without even realizing what it says. But look at that what, that, what that says. Jesus says, for the Son of Man is who? Lord. Jesus refers to himself all the time as Son of Man. And he just says right there, I am the Lord. So he says, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. You know what that is saying to a Jew? They worship the Lord. They worship Jehovah in the Old Testament. And they're sitting there saying, well, you just broke the law. And he says, no, I am the Lord, God, the creator that you worship. They either had to get on their knees and say, oh, King, we, we trust you, or say, well, you're, you're blasphemy. That's blasphemy. What is the penalty for blasphemy? Death. So in their mind, they do not want to accept Jesus. So they're thinking all these different ways. How do we get rid of him? Well, now they got two indictments against him, don't they? <laughs> they got, we can stone him for breaking the Sabbath. We can stone him for saying he's God. And if it wasn't true, then they had every right to do that. But if it is true, they just condemn themselves for rejecting who Jesus is. So that's probably one of the most powerful verses in the entire Bible. Matthew chapter 12, and verse 8. And I just always would read over it and never thought about it. But Jesus is saying, I, the Son of Man, am Lord, even of the Sabbath day. So he's saying, I am God. What a powerful, powerful verse. Jehovah Witnesses need to read that verse, don't they? Yes. Maybe that would help them see who Jesus really is. Now, verse 9 says, and um, it says here in verse 9, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. So wherever he was before, he was kind of outside. Now he marches right into their synagogue. This would be equivalent to somebody coming into a church, right? And so the people believe in him. The religious leaders in the swamp, or no, maybe I shouldn't call it like that, but the, the, the political people hate him and want to get rid of him. What a thing when the people support someone and the polls prove that, you know, the people are behind this guy, but then the people are using the law against this guy. But we've never seen anything like that before in history, have we? Oh, wait a minute. I think we're kind of seeing that now, right? <laughs> Interesting, where the people are behind, but the ones in power are trying to stop the movement. That's interesting. That's interesting. So isn't it wild how history repeats itself? Interesting. All right, now we go back to verse uh, 10. All right, so Jesus goes into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? that they might accuse him. So Jesus has been accused twice of something that's a penalty worthy of death. So he goes in there and finds a guy who's got a withered hand and he looks around and he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now, I don't know of any Old Testament verse that says thou shalt not heal on the Sabbath day, but it says do no work. Well, is a miracle a work? Well, it takes some work to do a miracle, I guess. But Jesus wants them to accuse him even more. But at the same time, what he's about to do is to prove even more who he is. So he's condemning them while they're condemning him. He just keeps heaping it on them. <laughs> the more you keep saying what you're saying, the facts prove otherwise. We don't see anything like that nowadays, do we? 
They keep saying this and that about some guy, and the facts keep coming out that they're lying about that guy over there, right? Uh, there was no Russian collusion, was there? But anyway, uh, enough, of, enough of that. But isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? How history repeats itself. So Jesus grabs this guy and says, want to see something? You say, it's, is it lawful for me to heal this guy? Well, if he can, then he's God and they need to shut up, right? But if, if they're going to come back with the law and say, no, you shouldn't do that, then all the people are going to go, well, what meanies? They don't want this guy to be healed. So he's got them in a... And a rock in a hard place, I guess, if you will, is the way you say it. So what did he do? Well, verse, um, verse 11, he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? No one answers. Crickets. Because every one of them in the back of their mind went, Don't. I think I probably did that once or twice. And their whole life, if you know the Jews, every Saturday, they just stay home. They're not allowed to go do something. And from time to time, they would have to go do something like this. Otherwise, their sheep would die. So they would sin. What happened if they sinned? Well, then they would come and bring a sacrifice, right? So the law says don't do it, but if you do, then you bring a sacrifice. That's how you get forgiven. So they know the law, but they sometimes would break it and then just do the sacrifice just to get forgiveness. So Jesus is heaping it on, isn't he? So which one of you has not broken the law at least one time? And they're like, <clears throat> I'm sure they're coughing, <clears throat> kind of walking around. Kind of, yeah, Jesus knows their heart and he knows. Uh, just wow, Jesus is, is giving it to them, isn't he? And so it says, verse 12, How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. So Jesus says, hey, you guys, you're condemning me of stuff that you yourself do. I think this guy is more important than a sheep. I'm going to show you something. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth and it was restored whole like as the other. Now, I don't know what that was like, what the withered hand was like. Maybe he had missing fingers. Maybe he just had the palsy where his hand was like this. I had a friend in Bible school who, when he came out of the birth canal, I guess his mom didn't push fast enough or something. He got caught in there and it, it affected his arm for the rest of his life because blood supply didn't go. And so his arm was like this his whole life. And so he had kind of a withered arm. And we would go surfing. And you know what? He made up for that by having this arm twice as big as the other one. And when we go surfing, the first time we went together surfing, I thought, man, he's just going to paddle in circles. But he didn't. He could hold that barely on this side. And he paddled out faster than I did. Wow. And so it was amazing. So I don't know, you know exactly what that withered hand entailed or whatever, but whatever it was, it was noticeable. And Jesus healed that. And that guy was just like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so Jesus healed him. What a blessing to see the Lord heal. And so that, again, proves who Jesus is, right? That he is the Messiah. So he's more than just a prophet. Now, the prophets could do some miracles in the Old Testament. But you have to say, man, he's more than just a prophet. He's the king. Now, we haven't got to the priest yet. He has to die to be the priest because now he's the high priest in heaven. So it's all coming together here. And these Pharisees, man, how could they be so stupid unless it was willful ignorance? Because as you get into this and you really look into this, if you were there, you would have believed by now, wouldn't you? All these things that Jesus did. But then look at verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. So they did an impeachment against him. Twice, probably. No, I don't know. But, <laughs> and did it work? It did not. How, how odd. But I would believe him if he's healing people, wouldn't you? But they wanted to destroy him and his ministry. And he's helping people. Makes me wonder, were they helping people? No. Remember when Jesus went to the temple? What did he do? He had a whip. And he went in and started whipping them and kicking over the tables of the money changers. People think Jesus is just happy, lovey, lovey Jesus, right? Oh, he's just so lovey. He loves everyone. <laughs> Imagine their face when they saw him come in the temple. He's like, you're making my father's house a den of thieves. Boom, starts kicking things over and swip, you know, lashing people. They wouldn't even be like, ah, and running away. But that's Jesus. And he had every right to do that because one place he says my father's house and the another place says my house. 
because he's God. That, that's his place. So they sought how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. So it's better to be with the one who's right than to be with the ones that are wrong. Because the ones that are wrong will pay for their sin. It might take a little while, but when the truth comes out and shows that they're on the wrong side, they're going to be sorry they didn't go to the right side. That's sad to think about. And he charged them that they should not make him known. Again, Jesus says, don't go tell anybody. Isn't it weird when Jesus says that? You would think he would want his fame to go abroad even more. But again, he's trying to keep it only to Israel. And I think this shows his humility as well. He's pretty humble. It's not all about him. It's about will you receive that for the prophecy of Daniel to come so the kingdom will come. And uh, he's healing people. The, the true people of the crowds, the poor people, knew who Jesus was. It was the rich people, and they didn't want him. Now, verse 16, and charged them that they should not make him known. Now, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So here's a quote from Isaiah 42. We're going to turn over to Isaiah 42. But he mentions the Gentiles. So Jesus knew exactly what was going to take place. He knew that they were going to kill him. And that he would be the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And that the Gentiles would get saved because they rejected him. Now they could have accepted him. And the kingdom could have started back then. But see, Jesus knew either way this is what's going to happen. And so he knew this was going to take place. And so here we have kind of a foreshadowing. Here we have him telling you, hey, I'm going to save Gentiles too. Now whenever you would have spoken back then as a Jew and you used the word Gentile... They did not like that word. <laughs> You've got to understand the mindset of a Jew. Jews did not like Gentiles because they saw what Gentiles were. And most Gentiles did not believe in God on the Bible. So most Gentiles were like the Roman Empire. You know what they did in the Roman Empire? They, they, they were so sinful that they would have orgies all the time. And they would get together and have orgies and gorge themselves with food and get drunk. And they would eat so much food that they would go and they go vomit it up again so they could go eat more. That's how decadent. There's a word for that. Um, it starts with an H. What is that word, Laura? A hedonistic. Okay. And they were just <laughs> sinful. They loved and delighted in sin. And the, the Jews, well, they wanted to be holy. So when you'd say Gentile, they think, oh, and here Jesus says Gentile twice. <laughs> so he just keeps making them not happy. It's kind of funny. And no wonder that the Pharisees didn't like him because they only saw what they wanted to see. They didn't see what they should have seen. So Isaiah 42, verse 1 through 9. And in my Bible, there's a star by each one of these verses, which means it's a prophecy. It says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Well, that's interesting because here they are judging Jesus, and he's going to be the one that judges them, and not just them, all the Gentiles too. He shall not fall, or no, excuse me, he shall not fail, nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. The isles, who would that be? The Gentiles that live in the isles, like in Greece and places like that. Thus saith God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretcheth them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth bread unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand. <laughs> Interesting. We just saw him hold some guy's hand and heal it. 
Isn't that interesting? Coincidence, maybe, nor maybe that's prophecy. And will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. So here is what he's quoting in the Old Testament. And a lot of that has to do of, of God. And it says, thus saith God the Lord. I the Lord. So that's Jesus Christ speaking. That's his words back then. And now he's quoting them again. How amazing is that? All right. So back to Matthew chapter 12. And we'll try to finish this up. We've got a lot more to get into. But we should go pretty quickly through the rest of this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Oh, by the way, verse 21, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. When does this take place? In the church age. So that's kind of a foreshadowing of he knew the Jews would reject him and Gentiles would get saved after. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Then it says, and all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? Well, if he's the son of David, then he's a king because he's from the lineage of the king. So that's an interesting thing to say. Is this not the son of David? So they're saying, is he not the king? Is he not the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. <laughs> and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And it continues there, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So we have here Jesus talking. It wasn't enough that they accused him of breaking the Sabbath and wanted to stone him for it. It wasn't enough that they accused him of blasphemy, saying he's God and wanting to stone him. Now they want to accuse him of being demon possessed. I mean, this just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? And Jesus says something, a house divided against itself shall not stand. How about America? I think of America. America is divided, isn't it? You would think that when we vote for politicians, we're voting for people that would do what's best for our nation. It seems like everything they are doing is the opposite of what's best for us. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's destroying us on purpose. What could the reason be for that unless they've sold themselves out to globalism? And that's what we're seeing today is the rise of globalism, where what they're doing is because the UN wants it done, not because the people want it done. And that's a sad thing. What is the agenda? It's called Agenda 2030. That's why they're getting rid of uh, vehicles and wanting you to have battery powered vehicles. That's why they're closing in Alaska, not allowing to drill up there, driving up the price of everything. It's just, it's really sad, but it's not because these people are inept and don't know what they're doing. They're destroying the country on purpose so that the Antichrist can come in. And that's something that a lot of people don't know, but that's what's happening in the world today. So Jesus goes through here, talks about, hey, I don't have a devil. And there's so much we could get into, but I just find it interesting. The strong man and how the whole thing is to whoever's a strong man, take him down so they can go spoil his house. So they want to steal from us, basically. So they get richer and we get poorer. And that's their agenda. And that's so sad because we're supposed to all be equal and we should all have the same rights and privileges and we should all be able to go work hard and get ahead. But so sad that so often they take from us. And that's communism. And that's one of the things the devil's using today is to take from the rich to give to the poor. And uh, that's really sad. Okay, a lot more I could get into that. But let's look at verse 31. Because 31 here, Jesus says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven against men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So 31, 32, I guess I didn't write that up here right. But 31 and 32 are talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, yeah, it's all, it's all contained there. And the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit has to do with when Jesus is here telling him to his face, you have a devil or you're demon possessed. Now, some people say this is the unforgivable sin and they say you can do this today. And I can't tell you how many phone calls, how many emails I get from people who are just, just scared to death. I think I committed the unforgivable sin. I say, really, what is it? Well, I don't know. Oh, so how do you know if you did it if you don't know what it is? So I thought what we do is quickly look at the other passages and the cross references because it's very clear that this is not a sin that you can do today. This is a sin that is only possible to do in one world or another world, but not in our world. Look what it says again in verse 32 at the end. It shall not be forgiven him neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Okay, so let's turn over to the cross reference of Mark chapter 3. And I want you to know, don't worry about whether you commit this or not, because this is a sin that can't be committed today. It could be committed while Jesus was on the earth in his ministry. And I believe it can be committed again when Jesus is on earth again. But right now, Paul says that all sins are forgiven. So you have to understand dispensations. Look at, um, well, I said go to Mark 3. Okay, keep your hand in Mark 3, but go to Luke chapter 12 first, and then we'll come back to Mark 3. Luke chapter 12, and then Mark chapter 3. Luke chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. Here's the cross reference. But I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Okay? Now go back to Mark chapter 3. So this is a blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, also called the, the unforgivable sin. What is it? Mark chapter 3, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. What is it that is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? What is the unforgivable sin? Verse 30 says, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So that makes it very clear that the sin of blasphemy that cannot be forgiven is the sin of telling Jesus to his face, you have a devil or you have an unclean spirit. And that's what they just did. They did it when? They did it right here during his earthly ministry. But then Jesus died, was buried and went to heaven. So Jesus is in heaven now. Can we do that now? I don't see how. Now people say, well, I can say it now. Well, Jesus is up there though. And Paul says, no, the blood of Jesus cleanses, well, John, cleanses from all sin. But Paul tells us, having forgiven us all trespasses. All means all. So there's no sin now under Paul's ministry that anyone can do that is an unforgivable sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sins. But it sounds like out here, if somebody in their natural body says, Jesus, you have a devil, that's the world to come, remember, that that, that might be unforgivable in that time. So back to Matthew chapter 12 and look very carefully at the end of verse 32. It shall not be forgiven him neither in this world, so during the time of Christ, nor in the world to come. That would be a different world over here because the world's all different. When Jesus comes back, he changes it. So, but today, is there one sin that can't be forgiven? If there is, then what good is the blood of Jesus? It can't forgive all sins. So it must be a dispensational thing that here and here but not applying to here. And I guess maybe in the tribulation, somebody could do that too. So maybe, maybe I'll put over here as well. But during our time, that's not something you can do. Okay. Now I'm not telling you to go try it. <laughs> it's not a good thing to say, but the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sins. Now I, I don't have time to turn to it, but Colossians 2.13 says, having, give, having forgiven us all trespasses. So according to the apostle Paul, all sins are forgivable today. And then 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. So I believe all means all. And the only way to rightly divide that sin of blasphemy or unforgivable sin is it had to only take place while Jesus is here on earth or over here. Now maybe, possibly here, but it sounds like it's the world to come, so it's, it's over here. And it sounds like you're saying this to God 
and he's right there before you and you're telling God as you're looking at him, hey, you've got an unclean spirit. So like I said, it's more like here. Does that make sense to you? So please don't call me. (laughs) Please don't email me and say, I think I've committed the unforgivable sin. Know what that sin is. And I showed you the scriptures. It's saying, God, you have an unclean spirit and it's only possible back then or over here. Because here, all sins can be forgiven. Okay? Amen. Got that? That's a fun teaching, but it's a lot of people don't get it. There's this guy that's been calling me for like five years. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's pretty messed up. So many drugs he's done in his life. And it's just always, I don't think I get saved because I committed the unforgivable sin. I said, no, this is what it is. You, you did, were you here alive here? No. Are you live over here? No. Then here, all sins can be forgiven. He just doesn't seem to get it. And he might be demon possessed because one thing I've noticed that people that that are scared that they might have a lot of times they say, well, I hear this voice in my head that told me I did this. I said, well, you need to get away from that demon then is what you need to do. So uh, we'll get into that more here in a moment. But I got to finish this up. So let's keep going. Now, verse 33, it changes. So we're talking about how they said he had a devil and Jesus is calling that. Hey, that's a sin telling me that I have a devil. He says, I'm not going to forgive that sin. So the Pharisees didn't get forgiven that said that, it sounds like. It was like God says, all right, you condemned yourself to where you're going to hell no matter what you do. And so they crucified Jesus. Now the next verse says, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Okay, so now Jesus talks again about this fruit thing. And this is in... Matthew chapter 7. So flip back to Matthew chapter 7 real quick. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus already said this. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by your fruits ye shall know them. What does that sound like? A tree being cast into the fire. Well, let's back up to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, here's John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The fire. So what do we have here? We'll go to Romans chapter 11. And I don't know if I have a place to, to write this. I'm running out of room. But Israel, in God's eyes, is like a tree. And in Romans chapter 11, and for sake of time, I guess I won't read it now, but I'll just tell you what it says. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, verse 11 through 19, and verse 24 through 27, Paul the Apostle says that Israel was like a tree. And he says, and it was like a tree that was cut down. Because they rejected their Messiah, and he called it an olive tree, a wild olive tree. He called us a wild olive tree, but he called it a tree. And because they rejected their Messiah, God cut down the nation of Israel, and then he grafted in those who get saved. So we get grafted in, and then that tree begins to grow back again. And we're part of that. So that's what it's talking about. A lot of people will go to this verse and say, by your fruit you shall know them, and they try to make you a person and say, I'm going to look at your fruit. And we call those fruit inspectors. And they run around and they say, well, you don't do good enough work, so I don't know if you're saved or not. You ever hear people like that? That's a lot of your Calvinist and Lordship Salvationists. But really the context is more about a nation than a person. Now, when we were at the funeral here the other day, we we, uh, talked to this woman and she told us about how so many bad things happened to her in just a couple of weeks and it started with her house burning down and then her son died and then another family member died all within three weeks and so we were asking her questions and everything and we we're just like well, how did it happen what happened and tell us and she said that after a couple of years that big huge oak tree in the front of the house she said we thought we lost that forever it was such a beautiful tree she said that tree started sprouting out again And she said, that's a resurrection, she said. And we were so delighted to get that tree back. So I thought, man, that's a great illustration. And God has cut down the tree of Israel because what? They rejected him. 
That's us being grown up in there into the, the branches, if you will. And that's how we are now part of the promise of God in many ways. Now, that's not replacement theology. All right. We don't believe that, that, that now God's never going to deal with the Jews again. It says in uh, Romans 11 that God will go back to dealing with the Jews as well. But that's interesting. So there's your tree analogy. So back to uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34 now. Jesus says this, and this is your mean Jesus, right? You, most of the churches you go to, they say, oh, Jesus is just so nice and caring and loving. They don't read passages like this. But Jesus only says this to the people that are evil. He's always compassionate to the people that are trying to do right. But to the ones that are evil, he does not mince words. He tells them straight up, hey, you guys are evil. So Matthew 12, 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So Jesus can see the heart of people. That's what's amazing. Jesus can look inside and know what a person is, is feeling and thinking. I wish we could see that sometimes, but other times I, I'm glad we can't. Because, you know, you, you might know what somebody actually thinks about you. You know, I don't know. That might not be good. But Jesus knew their heart. And he stands up to those Pharisees and he says, you're a generation of vipers. What's a viper? He just wants to bite you. So they just want to bite and devour. And he says, how can ye being evil? Jesus says, you're just evil. Speak good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of a good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Now Jesus says this, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. What a powerful verse that everyone who's not saved will give account of themselves to God for every word that they say. Every dirty joke. We walked downtown in New Orleans and we walked by and this guy said something. Had a sign that says, dirty jokes, a dollar a piece or something. And I just, I just thought, how horrible, man. He's going to be given a lot of account. And I was just like, oh, what an awful thing, man, that he's down there making money telling dirty jokes. I wish he knew this verse. Every idle word that a man shall speak, he shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now verse 37, for by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, is this a passage for us today, doctrinally? No, because we're not justified by our words. We're justified by faith. Paul tells us that. It must be Jesus is talking about here, and it must be here. Because, guess what? The Antichrist comes. And the Antichrist says, you've got to swear allegiance to me. And if you say, yes, I follow you, give me your mark, then by your words, it's over. But if you say, no, I choose Jesus, I don't want the Antichrist. They cut your head off. Well, you're justified in God's eyes because by your words, you said, no, I choose Jesus. Now your soul goes to heaven. So isn't that interesting? So as we're going through, remember, most of the book of Matthew is Jesus talking to right here and to these people over here and here. Little bit of Matthew applies to us, but still we can apply some things spiritually. And we can certainly apply verse 36, the day of judgment, to people today that aren't saved. They're going to have to give account for every idle word. Now, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Lots to get into here. I just have to go over it quickly in passing. The Jews seek after a sign. This was the sign of Jonah. By the way, it says whale. How many of you heard some preacher that say, it was just a big fish, it wasn't a whale? I've come into many, many of them are Southern Baptists usually, but I've, I've talked to many pastors and they say, it wasn't a whale, it wasn't a whale, it wasn't a whale. I'm like, no, Matthew 12, uh, 40, it says it's a whale. And so it's just funny that shows you that some people don't read their Bible because in another place it says big fish. No, it was a whale. Well, they say, well, there's no, there's no fish that's a whale. Have you ever heard that before? There's no such thing as a fish because fish breathe underwater. A whale goes when it comes up. So a whale is a mammal. And they say, there's no such thing as a whale that's a fish. There's what's called a whale shark. Have you ever heard of them? They have them down in Honduras and places like that. And it's actually a whale that's also a fish. 
and it can swallow. And there's historical um, times when people have found inside of that a human being. So the Bible's always right, okay? The Bible's always right. So what is this sign? It's three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, Jesus died and was buried. How long? Three days and three nights. And when again. So that book of Jonah was a sign of what Jesus would do. He would die and buried and rise again. But also another interesting thing is during the time of Jonah, if you read the book of Jonah, Jonah's the greatest preacher that ever lived in the history of the world. How's that? He converted a whole city to the Lord. I've never met another preacher who's ever done that. And it sounds like there was a bunch of people there. But he was a little unhappy with that because they were Gentiles and he was a Jew. He didn't really want to see him. He was going there to preach the condemnation message to him. And then he went up to sit there and watch him die is what it sounds like. If you read the book, have you ever thought of that when you read it? Because he's up and then he's all upset that they didn't die, that they repented. And so he's all like, oh, and he's all upset. So he was happy to go condemn people. He was lacking a little bit on that right there. Is Jesus telling the Pharisees, hey, you're kind of like them. You want to condemn me quickly, but you don't have any grace, do you? Hmm, maybe, maybe Jesus is in his mind. He's telling the Pharisees that as well. But three days, three nights. But also they say that historically there was a sign in the heaven that took place in the time of Jonah. And that's what scared the people. His preaching and that sign in the heaven. And that's why they repented. And you know what it was? It was a great eclipse that took place during the time of Jonah. We have in America an eclipse in 2017 it went this way across the country. And in 2024, it's going to go this way across this country. And historically, all throughout history, people see an eclipse. They always look at it as a bad omen. So I don't know. Is that a bad omen for America? Do they need to repent like Nineveh did and get right with God? I think so. I think so. So that's the sign of, of Jonah. Now, let's finish up here. We're almost done. And it says here in verse 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Amen. That's Jesus. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And that's Queen Sheba, I believe it is. Uh, verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Now, as you read this chapter over and over, it's just like everything's just like out of order, off the wall. Just it, a lot of this doesn't make sense. I mean, it's talking about one thing. Boom. It talks about something else and something else. Isn't that weird how it just jumps around so much? It must somehow have some cohesion to where it comes together. Because Jesus is talking about these people are condemning me. Well, guess what? Someday you're going to be condemned by the people that are dead. Isn't that weird? So that's at the judgment. And then he starts talking about Nineveh. Well, that makes sense with Jonah. But then he talks about the queen of the south. What does that have to do with anything? I don't know. But then he starts talking about unclean spirits. Is he saying that the Pharisees had devils in them? I wonder. I wonder. Maybe that's why he's talking about that, because those religious leaders were demon possessed. What does that make you think about America? The political leaders? What if they were demon possessed? Wouldn't that be creepy? But I don't know, you know, they say things like they drink adrenochrome and do things to kids and stuff. It makes you wonder if, if that person doesn't have a demon that would do something like that, if that's true. OK, now it says here, Jesus says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So Jesus starts talking all of a sudden about demonic spirits. And he says that a spirit can go inside of a person. All right. If you're saved, you can't have a demon in you because of Ephesians 1.13. And it says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How does a demon break that seal and get in there where the Holy Spirit is? I don't believe it can. I believe you can be oppressed by devils, but I don't believe you can be possessed by devils if you're saved. He's talking about people here that aren't saved and something happens where a devil leaves. Now, how does a devil leave? Sometimes they have a thing called an exorcism. 
You know what an exorcism is? You read the book of Acts, the priests would come and do exorcisms. They were exorcists is what they're called. And it says, Jesus is saying, when that one leaves, back come more. So a person that has a devil or a demon, what they call them today, demons, and that person somehow has an exorcism done to them and that leaves, oftentimes that person's going to be worse off because more are going to come back. So the priests aren't helping people very much, are they? So what is the cure for demonic possession? Salvation. If you get saved, then you get the Holy Spirit. Now you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And now I don't see how it can come in you if the Holy Spirit is in you. But it's interesting what Jesus is saying here. So be very careful of priests that go around doing exorcisms. Where do we see that today? In Rome? <laughs> you ever heard of that? It makes you wonder if they don't have demons themselves that are doing the exorcism and if they're not helping people. Now, as a kid, I never saw that movie, The Exorcist. I don't like scary movies like that. I will not watch things like that. But they say that that's what it's really like. They vomit and stuff like that. And just, oh, it's horrible. But do you think an unsaved man can come in and, and fix all that? No. God's got to fix that. And salvation is the answer to demonic possession. So if a person is demon-possessed and there's an exorcism, then, then those devils could return with more. And so um, I won't get into more. I mean, you all know where demons come from, right? That's one thing that a lot of churches don't talk about. But in Genesis chapter 6, you had the fallen angels come and they did something with the daughters of men and produced giants. And the Bible says that those giants were of tall stature and they had six fingers and six toes. Now, what are we? I'm running out of room up here. We're three parts. We that are human being, we're a body, we're a soul, and we're a spirit. So we're three parts. Now, what is an angel? An angel is called a spirit. And somehow an angel can take a body because sometimes an angel showed up in a body. But angels don't have souls. They're just a body and a spirit. So if something with a body, soul, and spirit can somehow uh, come together and produce offspring with something that's just a spirit that has a body, then what they would produce would have a body and a spirit but no soul. So when that body died, that spirit begins to wander the earth. And because that wasn't part of God's plan, what happens to that spirit? I don't know if that spirit's going to last forever or if that spirit somehow is just going to one day not exist anymore because God didn't plan for that to happen. So I don't know. So I don't know if demons know that someday they're just going to cease to exist or if demons are going to end up in hell burning with the devil. I don't know. The Bible says that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, well, that would be the fallen angels. It doesn't say that hell is prepared for the devil's angels and for demonic spirits. So I think about these things and I wonder if somehow unclean spirits will somehow cease to exist. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll last forever and go to hell too. But whatever they are, they're evil. And they used to have a body and now they don't. So they can inhabit a body. And that's what they're looking for. And they're, whew, they're evil. So, huh. Is it scary? Well, if you're saved, it's not because they can't touch you. But have you ever seen a person that had an unclean spirit? I have seen some people in my life. And the first thing that, that you see is they want to cut themselves. They like to give pain to the person that they're in. And another thing they like to do is get naked. And I can't tell you some of the stories I saw in Honduras driving down the road and seeing some person. This, I saw this woman who's butt naked walking down the road and she had the weirdest hair like she'd been sleeping in a ditch or something. And she's going, like that. And she's talking to somebody. Crazy. I don't know who she's talking to, but she's talking to, or maybe somebody's talking through her. And there was a guy, too, in the town where we lived, and he was demon-possessed. And he slept in the streets. And he'd just sit there and watch you as you walk by. And every now and then he'd say, blah, 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 blah. And everyone knew he was that crazy guy. And it was so sad. It's so sad. So those things exist. And the question is, how do you get a demon? They say you have to ask for it. They don't just go around jumping into lost people. So don't get into the occult. Don't get into new age. Stay away from that stuff so you don't get those. Okay, it's very important because you don't want to get that. Stay away from Ouija boards, right? Yeah. Have you ever heard of kids playing with Ouija boards? That's horrible. That will get you into the spirit world and can get you opened up to those if you're not saved. Stay away from that. And so let's finish up here. This comes in the Bible, which for many years, I'm like, why on earth is this even in the Bible? 
Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters. This is my theory. I can be wrong, but I'm just going to throw it out there and see what you think. Let's read it to the end of the chapter there, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. So here comes Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters. And they said, hey, Jesus, we need to talk to you. Now, you don't want to interrupt him if he's in the middle of a sermon, right? <laughs> so there's something massively wrong that they would come and try to talk to him. Something big happened in the family. What was it? Then said one unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Why would Jesus say that? Why wouldn't Jesus say, oh, my mom's here. Okay, let's go see what she wants. Why would, and then why would he say something about father? Now, I don't know, but do you know the Bible never mentions Joseph ever after that? He's mentioned before Jesus is born, but we don't hear hardly anything else about that guy named Joseph, which is Jesus' adopted father. So could it be that Joseph passed away here? I don't know. I might be stretching, but that to me kind of connects the dots that perhaps that's why Jesus says what he says. Because Jesus tells us that Joseph is not his real father. Who's his real father? Mm -hmm. So that's my thought on that. Again, I'm not teaching that dogmatically, okay? Oh boy, I tell you, they're going to be making videos. Breaker says. No, this is just me just thinking out loud, okay? But what if... Joseph passed away because at the cross, Mary's there looking at Jesus. Where's Joseph? He's not there. So what happened to Joseph? Um, he might have passed away. And maybe they're coming and they're saying, hey, Jesus, your father died. And he says, who's my father and my mother? Except, see why he would say something like that? That, that makes more sense why he would say. Otherwise, why the heck would he say such a weird thing off the wall like that? You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense unless possibly that's what happened. And that's why he says that. And that, again, makes the point that who is Jesus Christ? He's God. He's not just some man from some manly father. So that's just my thought on that. I think we'll close there. I appreciate you all listening. And uh, that was a little long chapter, but I tried to get through it as quickly as possible. I don't know if we have time for questions, but real quick, if anybody has a comment or anything real fast. Yes, sir. You were talking about uh, the corn not actually being corn. Mm -hmm. Okay, explain where it says ear. They were taking the ears of corn. Okay, well that's a good question. The ears of corn. <laughs> All I know is you go to the dictionary and it says that corn is any kernel. Right. And you go back in history, they didn't have corn. But if you've ever looked at a piece of wheat, a piece, like. piece of wheat has... And all the little seeds are on this little thing. So in my mind, that would be the ear that it's talking about if that's the kernel. But you go back in history, it wasn't until like the Middle Ages that they started to find corn because corn was all over America and not in Europe or over there. So in our mind, we think corn, we think an ear of corn and Jesus is like, you know, like typewriter, like we said, is getting ding. But the, the only thing I can say as you look and you study history and you study the dictionary and you look at some commentaries and other things, they say that that's what it was, that it was the kernel of, uh, what am I saying here, wheat. And that, so that must be what's the ear. Now, I don't want to run to the Greek or whatever. We could look up that in the Greek language or whatever too as well, but that's the best explanation I can give you right there. I think that was a okay. corny question. A what? <laughs> that was a corny question, a very corny question. But does that make sense? And I could get more into that, too. Wheat is amazing. Have you ever looked at wheat? There's the wheat and the tares. Tares look just like wheat as they grow up together, and you can't tell the difference until the harvest. You know what wheat does in the harvest time? It turns gold while the other stuff stays green. We're going to have a glorified body and live in a gold mansion. And before it turns gold, though, it gets a little bit of purple on it. Purple is the color of royalty. So that's just amazing that, that we're kind of like wheat. Anybody else? Anybody else? Good question. Good question. Well, thank you. I look forward to next week, and we'll start Matthew chapter 13, if we're still here. Amen? <laughs> We've got the Feast of Trumpets coming up, and we're excited about what if this is the rapture. If it's not, though...
don't be discouraged because it's got to come very, very soon. And just know that I think that Revelation 12 sign is for Israel. So be watching Israel because something big is about to happen for them. It and actually it is. they're about to, to get together with Saudi Arabia and sign a seven year agreement of peace with Palestine. Um, with King Charles in, in England, they signed seven years. You've got the Agenda 2030 with the United Nations. And this month, they're meeting to affirm their seven year commitment to the agenda. It's all coming together. I don't see how the Lord can tarry, but His time is His time. And we, as long as we're here, we should be sharing the gospel with other people. Yeah. So please don't forget to do that because this is exciting times, exciting times.